Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for coming out. I don't know if it's raining yet, or um, if it is, thank you for braving the parking and the rain and coming to the fifth Sussman conversation about the Constitution and the courts. Our guests today are Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island and Professor Akhil Amar from Yale University, and Steve Sussman will be our moderator. Senator Whitehouse um, has had a long career in the law, and now he has been serving in the Senate since 2006. Before that, he was the US um, Attorney General of Rhode Island, and previous to that, he went to Yale undergrad and the University of Virginia Law School. His passion is for the environment, which plays out regularly on the Senate. He um, fights for clean air, clean water. He fights to reduce carbon um, pollution, and he wants to really position America as a leader in the clean energy economy. And it's something that's so important today, it gets short shrift, and here is Sheldon. <laughs> professor Akhil Amar is the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law. He is one of the foremost constitutional law scholars in America. His work has won awards from the American Bar Association and the Federalist Society. He has been favorably cited by the Supreme Court justices across the spectrum in over 30 cases, and he regularly testifies before Congress at the invitation of both Republicans and Democrats. Akhil writes for a vi wide variety of publications, from the New York Times to the Washington Post to Slate, and an interesting factoid is that he was an informal advisor to the West Wing when it was on television. He is the author of several books, and his next book, The Constitution Today, Timeless Lessons for the Issues of Our Era, will be published in September, just in time for the upcoming election. My husband, Steve Sussman, <laughs> And my husband, Steve Sussman, will moderate today's conversation. After serving as a law clerk for Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black 50 years ago in the 66th term, Steve has been trying commercial cases around the country, and he continues to do so. He is currently an adjunct professor at NYU School of Law, where he directs the Civil Jury Project in an effort to preserve our Seventh Amendment guarantee to trial by civil jury. So, gentlemen. We are in the middle of an election campaign in which both sides frequently invoke the Constitution and talk about the importance of appointing Supreme Court justices who will properly interpret it. Millions of Americans on both sides of the political spectrum believe that our government is not working for them. Some of the most vocal critics believe it is structurally defective. Both sides of the presidential campaign cite the Constitution in support of, those posi of their positions. Both candidates have called for amending the Constitution. Many claim the system is rigged. We have a Senate that isn't exercising its constitutional responsibility to advise and consent. We have a House that can't even pass an appropriation bill. We have a president who can only act by executive order, a Congress that cries foul for his violating the separation of powers doctrine, and a Supreme Court that is evenly divided along ideological lines and that is tied on some of the most constitutional, important constitutional issues of our day. We live today in the longest lasting democracy on the face of the earth. But we now confront the stark question, can the Constitution hold us together? We are here today to learn from two of our nation's foremost constitutional scholars what our founders intended, whether they foresaw what is happening today, and whether they built or intended to build a structure that can withstand the whirlwind we find ourselves in. I will put questions to Professor Amar and Senator Whitehouse 
in turn, and at the end, you will have an opportunity to do so as well. So let me begin with Professor Amar. Professor, our founders intended to create a republic, not a direct democracy. Couldn't one say that electing a president through the electoral college rather than popular vote, giving Rhode Island the same number of senators as Texas, <coughs> and, and allowing Congress to create rules that allow a minority of the Senate to veto legislation, couldn't one say that those are instances of the intentional rigging of our system in this country? Such a pleasure to be with you all. Thanks for coming, <laughs> Steve. And it's always an honor to be with my friend Sheldon, my friend Steve. So, um, we made it through a civil war. We made it through a Great Depression. I like our odds going forward. In 1787 or 1786, the year before the Constitution, democracy exists almost nowhere in the planet. Today, it reigns over half the planet by population and land mass. We won the last century, we being the forces of democracy. I like our odds going forward. We won because of the success of the United States Constitutional Project. So I'm quite bullish on it. Um, uh, um, and compared to what? Compared to Britain, compared to Germany. Um, Greece was mentioned before Italy. So do not lose heart, my fellow Americans. Now, one of the reasons that things seem to be difficult is we're a very closely divided society between red and blue, even in this state. So when half the horses want to pull the cart in this direction and the other half are trying to pull the cart in the other direction, that's going to create pressure. You can't blame the Constitution for that. That's just the nature of our society. And I think actually over the next few years, my side's going to win because the other side's going to die first. Um, and, um, and we'll start moving more in what I think is, truthfully, the, the better direction. On the specific questions, then I'll shut up. The Electoral College was designed to rig the system in a certain way, but not in the way that you might have thought, um, yet favored George W. in 2000. It could have favored Al Gore. Um, the day before the election, people were predicting possibly Gore would get um, um, a, a popular uh, minority, but an Electoral College majority. It was rigged, and, and you may not have been told why it was rigged. But if James Carver were here, and he would say, it's blank, stupid, and, and he'd fill in the blank with the word slavery. It's not big state, small state. It's not because they didn't believe in democracy. It's because in a, in a direct election world, the South loses every time because a huge proportion of um, its population are slaves who can't vote on election day. But with an electoral college, they can count the slaves be it at a three-fifths discount. America is not now and never has been divided big state versus small state. So I'm from California, and I don't begrudge the Rhode Islanders. It doesn't make that much of a difference. America is not divided big against small, never has been. It's divided north against the south, coast against the center, and cities against the, um, the hinterland. Those are the big divisions. The Senate's not perfect, but it's not skewed, really, in fact. Um, the Electoral College was skewed to favor the south because direct election, the North wins every time because they got all these people down in Virginia and part South that don't vote, they're called slaves. Four of, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, eight of the first nine presidential elections, it's a slaveholding Virginian who wins. Um, two terms of Jeff uh, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. Pennsylvania has more free people in 1800, way more voters in 1800 fewer electoral votes. The system was rigged for slavery. We don't have slavery anymore. Maybe we should get rid of the Electoral College. That's, a, that's an interesting thing. So it was rigged in favor of slavery. Senate's not perfect, um, but, but it kind of, it all uh, washes out. And as for minority rule in the Senate, my friend Sheldon and others come January can get rid of the filibuster in one day, and I hope they do so. He may have some thoughts on that. Sheldon? <laughs> Why, it, why has Congress been so ineffective? The last two Congresses have been the least productive in the history of Congress. So what's causing this uh, inertia in Congress, the inability to get anything done? One element is what Akhil referred to, which is the closeness of the political balance. The Senate is designed so that we don't tip as quickly as the House. We do have a supermajority 
precedent uh, in the filibuster, and that has a damping effect on how rapidly government responds. And in the ordinary course, that damping effect is not a bad thing. But when you're kind of on the bubble as to what the balance is, then what the filibuster can be used for is one gigantic no across everything. We also had a peculiar circumstance when President Obama was elected, which is that he came into office with huge approval ratings, unbelievable approval ratings. And the Republicans in Congress, still tainted by the bad opinion Americans held of the Bush administration, plus the bad opinion we always hold of Congress, plus the bad opinion that they had of Republican legislators, they were down in the, in the teens. So there was a 50, 60 point gap. And one way to deal with that is to just knock everything down because you're basically judgment proof versus the president. So there was not only the problem of the close political balance, but a really strategic success, it turned out for them, in trying to wreck and disable as much of government as possible in order to bring the balance back together. Um, the other piece that I see that is a lasting one is I think that Citizens United has created enormous political wreckage and enormous political problems. The Supreme Court missed an extraordinarily obvious fact that anybody who'd ever been in politics for a minute would have picked up if there had been one person who'd ever run for office on that Supreme Court, which is that if a big special interest is allowed to do something, like to spend unlimited amounts of money and to arrange it so that it's dark money and to avoid responsibility for what it's doing, they're also allowed to threaten to do that same thing. Every mom in this room knows that. You don't come through on your threats with your children every time. You let them know it's coming if they don't straighten out. And those threats or those promises were never gonna be transparent and therefore protected from corruption in the way that the Supreme Court foresaw. So it made a massive, massive error. And the result has been now that people who you, uh, Ellen mentioned my work on climate change. When I got to the Senate, there were regular bipartisan climate change bills all the time. Long comes 2010, Citizens United, flatline after that, absolute flatline. And you can see if you're watching the fossil fuel lobbying and political effort deployed to make that happen. It's not just an observed phenomenon, you can actually look at the steps undertaken to make that happen, like the threats to everybody by Americans for Prosperity that we're gonna spend $750 million in this election and if you cross us on climate change, you're gonna be, quote, severely disadvantaged. It's like a bad scene from an old mob movie. <laughs> Professor Barr, can you tell us now, we have Donald Trump wants to amend the First Amendment so he can more easily sue the media for uh, libelous statements they make about it. Secretary Clinton wants to amend the First Amendment to get rid of Citizens United. Uh, do you think the, sec uh, the First Amendment needs amending? Can we get money out of politics without tinkering with our ver the ver the most, one of the most important amendments, rights we have in this country? So those are two different questions. So, um, uh, and, um, so you're right, Donald Trump. Uh, I, I wouldn't mess with the First Amendment, um, but I do believe in serious campaign finance reform. And, and so Donald Trump wants to make it easier to sue the media. And I'm trapped here, you see. Um, uh, he, he's a trial lawyer. He's a plaintiff's lawyer. But I actually don't want plaintiffs you know, suing um, uh, media defense. I don't want Donald Trump being able to take out the Washington Post because he doesn't like what the Washington Post says. So I'm a big believer in New York Times versus Sullivan that says, in a nutshell, even if um, the, the uh, a publication gets a fact wrong, um, if it, what, they didn't do it intentionally and they were trying to cover matters of public concern like uh, canvassing the conduct of, of lawmakers, of, of public servants, of people who want to be government officials, you've got to give them a little breathing room because um, they may make mistakes um, that are actually part of robust, uninhibited, wide open political discourse. And, um, and especially, because we, we, we had an experience with this, when the, the, the press could be sued for anything that they said unless they could prove the truth of it. 
How do you prove the truth of an opinion? And so if you couldn't, so, so we had in America, there was a time when we allowed the press to be really uh, censored, and that was not good. So I'm not with Mr. Trump. Let's not do that. Now, as for Citizens United, I, I actually. What is Citizens United hold? Well, it's con it, in a nutshell. So some people think it's, well, you know, our corporations, persons. And the answer is yes and no. And pe boy, people hate it when lawyers say that. Yes and no, both. But yes, um, it, they, you can't take away their property without just compensation. You can't shut them down. The New York Times is a corporation, and I wouldn't want to let President Trump just shut them down or take over you know, that building, just like, or, the, or and I wouldn't want to let President Clinton take over Trump Towers or any other building. They have certain, but on election day, one person, one vote, that's flesh and blood, human beings. Corporations don't vote on election day, but they do have certain rights. They have rights to property. They have rights to fair procedure. When they appear before the judge, she's going to have to constitutionally let them make arguments and, and give them due process. They are persons within the meaning of the Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, when they come to court, whether they're media corporations or ExxonMobil. So they're entitled. So one thing Citizens United said, Citizens United said, but there's a hundred years of precedent on this. Is corporations have certain constitutional rights. Now, Citizens United also talked about corporations being able to run ads. Sheldon doesn't like that so much, and if these ads ran against me, I wouldn't like it so much either. But I don't want to prevent the New York Times, basically, from editorializing. Um, uh, it's a corporation, or the Washington Post. Yeah, that would not be affected at all by the changes that anybody wants to fix the Citizens United problem. But, Nobody's against editorial pages. Well, so then we're going to distinguish between good publicity being given for free on editorial pages by the New York Times, and up, we're going to treat media corporations when they give favorable press coverage or editorial endorsements differently than, let's say, ExxonMobil when it takes out an ad. I don't love the idea of distinguishing between media corporations and non-media corporations. And if it did, then the game becomes ExxonMobil to transform itself into a media corporation with a new, you know, uh, or, um, and even if we were able to do all of that, there are rich individuals in the world. I happen to know some of them who bring me out to Aspen from time to time, and I'm very grateful when they do. I actually know multi-millionaires and even a couple of billionaires. They're very nice friends to have, and even if you could shut down all corporations, you cut, shut down the Koch brothers, they're individuals, um, or Soros. So so here's a, and I'm for campaign finance reform. So here's, and, and here's what I'll, one final thing I'll say. These ads, which some of them are despicable, but they have no effect on me personally, because I actually know what I think. Um, and if you know what you think, Donald, um, uh, so Jeb Bush spent $100 million and didn't get much out of those ads, and Meg Whitman spent gazillions of dollars, and, and Jerry Brown kicked her butt for the, the uh, 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 California gubernatorial race. Um, there's this uh, wor um, worldwide wrestling person. She ran for Senate twice in my home state, Linda McMahon, and she, she spent lots of money on ads, lost twice to lesser funded people. If, here's what's real campaign and fi finance reform. One person, one vote, secret ballot on election day by people who know their own minds. Now, that, the problem fundamentally, you all do. You're very motivated. You're, high, um, you're highly educated. And the ads, therefore, don't have that much effect on you. But they have an effect on others, and unfairly so. So we need to have campaign finance rules that make um, issues a little bit more accessible and available to our fellow citizens who then are less vulnerable to all these ads. Yeah, and there are lots of campaign finance things that we can have that are consistent with Citizens United. So Sheldon, why do we want to, what's the big deal? About, I just don't understand what the big deal is about getting rid of it. I mean, we want to get rid of the influence of something to get rid of the influence of money in politics, obviously. We all think that something should be done to to limit that or to balance the balance it. So, I mean, I'm not sure if it's just to say that, well, I mean, if you would have, like Hillary says, well, let's amend the First Amendment. What would she say? This amendment, you shall, 
does not apply to corporations? Is that how it would be amended? But then it seems come up with dra well, no draft the amendment because then the New York Times isn't protected or Jeff Bezos and, and, and Trump wants to go after Jeff Bezos. Let make no you know, mistake both in Amazon and the Washington Post. So I haven't seen the amendment that, that's been drafted that makes me sort of comfortable that's going to make things better rather than worse. So to what extent, Sheldon, is Citizens Uniting interfering with campaign finance reform. Is this just an excuse, that, another excuse that Congress is giving for not taking money out of politics? They blame, now they blame the, the Supreme Court for the First Amendment. Well, I think the baseline proposition is that I see absolutely no reason why a fictional entity like a corporation should have any role in elections whatsoever, under any circumstances. Even if it's the New York Times? Even if it's the New York Times except in their role as having their own opinions and their own voices, but not contributing money, not spending money on advertisements, not doing their things. If Exxon so wants- So I'm with you on contributions, but advertisements make me a little bit more nervous because what are op-eds? They're advertisements no, they're of not. a certain sort. No, they're not. Trust me, anybody who's run an election knows that an op-ed and advertisement are two completely different things. Nobody has ever feared a bad op-ed. A million dollar ad buy dropped in on you. An endorsement? Very rarely you matter very much. And, and don't want it, your opponent It's to... not a big deal. Okay. So it's not is, a big deal. And you've never seen a newspaper come to people and say, okay, I'm gonna need a big tax break on newsprint or else I'm gonna write a bad editorial about you. <laughs> Just doesn't happen. So in the practical world in which I live, you, that's not an issue. Mm -hmm. But you do see the big corporations come and say, look, you need to shut up on, can, on climate change, or we're going to put $5 million into the next primary against you. We're going to tee up Rush Limbaugh. We're going to tee up Americans for Prosperity, and you're done. Ask Bob Inglis. They took him right out. And but, but you, a corporation you, okay should with, not have that ability. But, but you think that Rush Limbaugh, you know, we, we have to let him editorialize. I don't like him, but As we have to let him editorialize. many people want to buy his stuff or yeah. be paid uh, through the radio station to do it, that's all fine. Okay. The difference is when somebody who is coming to Congress as a predator who wants stuff is allowed to do that when they're not even a human being. And what that does, among other things, is that it takes the people who run corporations and it gives them a new aristocratic status. They're already doing all right, usually. You know, we all bring to government our voices and our pocketbooks. And under the Constitution, we can say as much as we want, and we can say it as loud as we want, and we can spend as much as we want of our own money. But we don't usually get to go to another organization that's not even a human being and say, okay, now I command that as well. But we do if a Rupert Murdoch it's... and they, they, you can buy, you know, or Ted Turner, and you can buy CNN or Fox or your Jeff yeah, Bezos or the way... Washington Post. No, you keep going back to specific First Amendment protected press organizations. We can find a way to solve that. They're not the problem. Exxon is the problem. Coke Industries is the problem. Big Pharma is the problem. The insurance industry is the problem. They are the ones who are using the power of this new pressure that they have, this new artillery that they have, to shut down things that we would otherwise be able to do in Congress. And they're corporations. They're not real. They have no business. They are economic so entities, and they should stay in the economic realm. They should have no role. If the CEO wants to say something, fine. If the uh, employees of a corporation want to come and mob my office and say, we don't like it because you don't like my corporation I work for, fine. But the corporation as an entity should be out. And these phony baloney corporations that are just stood up for the purpose of playing in politics and nobody even knows who's behind them is even a worse adaptation. And the whole thing should go. So here's what okay. would be campaign, here's what would be, okay. here, here's, here's what would be because I don't trust the government to say which corporations are okay, you know, whether they're the New York Times or, or Fox um, or CNN, and which ones aren't Wait okay. Wait a minute. I, 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 but, I do, but I do believe in public financing of uh, elections. Yeah, but um, don't give me that we don't trust the government to make that choice. Uh -huh. Who's going to make that choice? We're going to make that choice. The public is going to make that choice through people we send to Congress. If they've made the choice wrong, the public can throw those people out. This business that the government is some remote thing that does things independent of what the people think. So is, we have a history. We actually have a, a history fair. of Congress passing 
laws about campaigns that favor incumbents, from the Sedition Act of 1798 to the so-called um, McCain-Feingold Reform Act, and they were all incumbent self-protective. And I understand if you're an That's incumbent, but, so that, but, but here, so here's, here's what McCain-Feingold did. It said in the two months before the general election, we're going to make it difficult for certain corporate entities to run ads about um, uh, uh, um, uh, congressional races. Well, if you can't explain, because no one's paying attention except in the two months before the election, and if you can't explain to people why the incumbent really should be tossed out, because um, not, not all incumbents, not the good ones, um, but if you can't actually make that case, then that's going to favor the incumbents over the challengers, and that's not a hypothetical. That is the so-called McCain-Feingold Reform Act, which, which lots of us on the left opposed from day one, because we saw it as more like the Sedition Act of 1798 than its support. And we believe in all sorts of campaigns. And I'll give you more examples of, I love Lincoln-Douglas debates. I don't think it's, that's a, it's not a fair example when I say, look, a lot of these decisions are made by the people through their elected representatives. And to say that they kind of come in from the government, some yeah. planet, okay. and that we then have to live under the rule of this far planet government, that's not the way our democracy works. And when your answer to that is the Sedition Act, right. well, my God, we're talking about the Sedition Act because we all know as people how wrong that was. Right. But I it think exists McCain in the minds of here because the people, but well, that's a totally different question. You're, you're, yeah. I'm still on the point that I think we can trust America to make a sensible decision between what is the press? It's not always going to be easy with bloggers and things like that exactly. out there. Ooh. Not always going to be easy. But you know that Exxon Mobil and Pharma and the insurance lobby aren't the press. Except when they start to buy or create their own new press outlets. And boy, it's going to be difficult to, to, to distinguish that. And John McCain gets in front of, I, I, I can show you chapter and verse, on the United so, States Senate, in the well of the Senate, he says, we got to stop this because they're running attack ads against us. And I'm thinking, yes, and that's what the First Amendment allows, is to run attack ads against John McCain. It actually, that's what the First Amendment does allow. Do you, for people. So I'm, I'm nervous for about people. being able to amend the First Amendment. I'm nervous about opening the floodgate. I'm nervous about what words you would use in the amendment. Right, as you say, very hard. Some of the amendments of the Bill of Rights definitely do. A corporation is a person. Uh, you can't take their property without just compensation. So you'd have to say a corporation is not a purpose, a, a, a person for purposes of the for first economic purposes. amendment. And maybe, this, I don't know, the second amendment, maybe they don't have a right to, we'll get to the second amendment in a second. But it would be easier Okay. And here's one where I'm with Sheldon. And this is a, a doctrine for over 100 years. Corporations, it's, it's the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment has due process and just compensation, and corporations are covered. It also has self-incrimination. And, and corporations not. have never had self-incrimination rights. And one reason why is self-incrimination is about protecting your soul. Um, uh, and corporations, and here's Sheldon's right, have no souls. So, so we have to, now we're in a complicated world in which so, there are persons for some purposes and not for others, and, and people hate that, lawyers talking out of both sides of their mouth, but we do have to ask these hard questions. Before so we Senator jump away from Clinton. this, though, let me say one last thing. We don't have to amend the First Amendment to solve Citizens United. What do we I think Citizens United is such a wretched and wrong decision and it's playing out so badly for the United States Supreme Court and dragging its reputation down that it will self-correct as new opportunities emerge to you, limit it. And here's Do one. you believe it's appropriate, do either of you believe it's appropriate for a candidate for the president to establish a litmus test for appointing a Supreme Court justice that says, I'm only going to appoint a justice who will uh, overrule Citizens United? It's Which is what Secretary Clinton has said. It's constitutionally appropriate. And if you've said it publicly, constitutionally appropriate. appropriate. And if they're willing to stand by that and take that to the electorate, and if that's something that the electorate wants, that's one of the checks and balances. So, so I, 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 don't, I don't love that. Suppose Hillary appoints me. <laughs> Suppose Hillary appoints me. Because I tell her I want to, I will overrule Citizens United. Akil, law professor, I go to you. I call Professor Amar. How should I write this opinion? 
overruling Citizens United. I need a little help here. What I say, yeah. in my opinion, so, how would I do it? So just um, on corporation, I'd sharply distinguish between I independent advertising, which I think is core press, and you get to do it, and campaign contributions, which are money into people's pockets that they can use for all sorts of purposes that aren't even um, expressive. They can use it for gasoline and pizza, and they can use it to, to hire their worthless brother-in-law or something um, because their wife is nagging them uh, you know, about their worthless brother. So, so campaign contributions can be severely limited, and corporations can be treated differently than individuals. Um, Sheldon is right. You don't need a constitutional amendment. You need the Supreme Court to be able to revisit its cases, as it often as it does. But boy, I think it's a real problem, a legal ethics problem, if you in your confirmation hearing, I'm looking at the judge right now, um, had made a promise that you, once you got on the bench, were gonna rule this way or that way, that you were gonna overturn, whether it's Roe versus Wade or Citizens United, oh, I don't like that, I think that's actually a violation of legal ethics 101. Um, Bernie said all this all the time, and I think Bernie was clueless, you know, not as bad as Trump, but, but, but clueless. I, um, it's unfortunate that Hillary got pulled a little bit in, in yeah. that direction. I'm proud of Barack Obama when he said, truthfully, he did not ask Merrick Garland how Merrick Garland would rule on Roe versus Wade, and Merrick Garland would not have given him an answer on that. And I'm proud of Merrick Garland for that, because I think he's an excellent, excellent judge, whom I hope is confirmed. And I'm proud of Barack Obama that he didn't ask that question. You should not ask judicial candidates for promises about how they're going to rule. Senator Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse, let me move on a little. Some have said that one of the problems with Congress getting anything done in national government is the gerrymandered districts from which people run uh, and primaries, closed primaries. Question number one is, is any of that caused by the Constitution? Are we, can we get rid of that by laws? Is any of that mandated by the Constitution? We can get rid of that by laws. Okay, we can do it by laws. Yeah. And are you in favor of open primaries? And this new thing that's going on in various places where, you know, districts are drawn fairly. I don't have a big feeling about that one way or the other. Um, we have open primaries in Rhode Island. If they were closed, I don't know how different it would be. When you're running statewide, there's kind of an insulation built in because you have to talk to everybody. You don't get to draw your districts and choose your voters. Uh, you've got to go to the voters that are out there and hope that they choose you. Uh, I do think that the gerrymandering problem is a really, really, really significant one. In uh, the 14 election, um, 2014, the uh, House, uh, if you add up all the votes around the country, more than a million more Americans voted for Democrats for the House than for Republicans. In 2012. Republicans. 2012. Sorry, I'm off. Yes, 2012. And, um, and yet, there's a majority of 50 uh, in the House. You have states like Pennsylvania and Ohio that went Democrat and yet sent two to one or better congressional delegations of Republicans because what they had figured out how to do was to take all the Democrats and stuff them into little super concentrated Democratic districts with people getting you know 80 and 90 percent of the vote, and then spread the rest of it out using computer analysis so that every Republican had a safe 58, 60% district that resulted from that hyper-concentration of the Democrats. And that kind of stuff has no business in our politics. And it seems that there's a simple solution that seems to work, which is independent commissions. Let me move on now to the Second Amendment. Senator Whitehouse, do we need to change the Second Amendment to get rid of assault rifles and keep potential terrorists or mentally sick people from getting access to any kind of weapon? No, those can be done legislatively. 90% of Americans support enhanced background checks and a ban on assault rifles. Uh, is there anything in the Constitution that gives organizations like the NRA the power to render Congress totally impotent in reacting to that 90% sentiment of the American people? There's nothing in the Constitution that allows them to do that. That's a question of having built up 
a very powerful political operation over time, and now being able to deliver these post-Citizens United type political threats that pre-Citizens United groups like that weren't capable of delivering with anywhere near the same venom or force. Do, was the decision on the Second Amendment, the court's decision on the Second Amendment, saying that it gives an individual the right to bear arms, as opposed to giving it a militia, the, the people the right to have a militia. Did, was that, does that make any sense? So let me try to connect the dots. Um, all this stuff, this is great. So um, uh, there is, I believe, in the, not just in the text of the Constitution, but in our traditions in almost all state constitutions, because remember, there are unenumerated rights, as well as enumerated rights, um, this is America, and basically people do have a right to have a handgun in the home for self-protection. Um, this is very deeply felt. I'm a Democrat. I'm a liberal. I don't have a gun in my home. Never have they scare me. Where do um, you get that right to have one in your home for self-protection? Well, as I said... Where, where it, in the words... Of, you, keep, you have a constitution in your pocket. I do. Would you read me the words from the Second Amendment to say, I have a right to keep a handgun in my house? So there, there are several uh, clauses. One so is, the, yeah, I, the I, I, I know by memory, but you know. Um, but the Second Amendment, the, the Fourteenth Amendment, see, what you call the Second Amendment, what you call the First Amendment isn't the First Amendment. What you call the Second isn't the Second. Almost every, think of an important Bill of Rights case that pops into your head. Just think about it. I promise you, you are typically not thinking about the original Bill of Rights that applies only against the federal government. You're thinking about a, a case that involves a state or local law. Roe versus Wade is Texas. Griswold versus Connecticut is a state. Brown versus Topeka Board of Education. New York Times versus Sullivan is actually the state of Alabama. Um, Lawrence versus Texas. Obergefell is Ohio. Our entire Constitution was transformed by the Civil War. And the second sentence of the 14th Amendment, adopted after the Civil War, and I can do it by memory, I could read it too, is, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Now, what are those privileges or immunities? You guys can follow along with me, OK? <laughs> Important fundamental stuff. Um, where do we find it? Well, if it's in the Bill of Rights, that's evidence of it. That's what lawyers call incorporation, speech, press, petition, assembly, free exercise. If it's elsewhere in the Constitution, that's evidence of fundamental stuff, habeas corpus. If it's in the Declaration of Independence, that's evidence that in America, we think that's really important. Pursuit of happiness. If it's in most state so constitutions. Where in these documents that you so list is the right every, to have a handgun in every, your home? Every single state constitution, with maybe one exception, including the Constitution of Colorado, explicitly provides. I wish, I don't like guns. They scare me. But, they, but this, there are as many guns in America as there are Americans in almost every state constitution. There's an explicit right to have a gun. And it's actually made explicit in these state, most state constitutions. It's not just about military matters. It's actually for self-defense, recreation, hunting. Now, I'm a liberal. I think, no, where do no, we no, get, no. hang on. Where do we get the rights to have contraception in the home? And our friend Hugo Black, for whom you clerk, he thought, oh, that's made up. And I say, no, it's actually in our American tradition. Liberals believe that there's a right to have sex in the home. Conservatives believe there's a right to have guns in the home. I say give them both what they want. This is America. We liberals have to be tolerant of gun culture the way we want conservatives to be tolerant of but you are minority not religions. Them that under either the Second Amendment, either the guns under the Second Amendment, or sex under the Fourth Amendment. You're going to some other amendment. The Fourteenth, right? which is the granddaddy of almost everything that you say is the Bill of Rights. It's all the Fourteenth Amendment, now, and the Ninth Amendment says there are unenumerated rights in our system. We can't list them all. Um, so hold on, and, and, I, and I believe in gun control. So here's the final point: you will never get total confiscation. It's just never ever going to happen anywhere. I believe in gun control. You're more likely to get it if you can tell folks, listen, the Supreme Court's not going to allow total confiscation. They've taken it off the table. Now, can we talk about sensible background checks and limits on the, the number of guns you can stockpile and the kinds of guns you can have? And why do you need assault weapons to defend your home against a burglar? And, and you, now we've taken off the table your argument that every 
reasonable regulation, no matter how commonsensical, is the first step that puts us on a slippery slope that ends in total confiscation. We've taken that argument off the table. Judge Justice Kennedy isn't going to let us, even if we wanted to, take away your handgun. So fine, you've got that. Your father gave it to you. It's deeply important to you. It's, it's how you grew up. Let's, now can we talk about sensible gun regulation, given that we've taken total confiscation but, off the table? But the By the way, the NRA are, hasn't gotten your message, Akhil. I wish, yeah, <laughs> Akhil, I, I hear you. I, you know. Akhil, the people who are the most outspoken gun advocates. Yes, we call them gun nuts. They're also the people who don't want the president to appoint judges who make law rather than apply law. And when you have to look at an amendment that talks about the privileges, what of quote it immunities of citizens of the United blah, 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 States. Blah. Yeah. When, when you put a judge on the court and ask him to read, tell me what the privilege is, of uh, an American citizen are. Yes. Aren't you giving him carte blanche or her carte blanche to make law? Well, I want them to pay attention not to what's in their own gut, but to what it are, uh, is in the American um, experience. And here's how you find it. Because you look at state constitutions. You look at the Declaration of Independence. You look at what's already in the federal constitution. And that's the overwhelming. So the word privacy doesn't appear in the Fourth Amendment. It appears in many state constitutions. And I think Griswold versus Connecticut is rightly decided. Um, I think Obergefell is rightly decided on same-sex marriage. I don't want judges to decide subjectively what they think is important. But I do think that the American tradition, including the state, everything in your federal constitution, almost every single thing in the federal constitution, state constitutions did first, from written so, constitutions to bills of rights to letting women vote to getting rid of slavery to having a bill of rights. So, so it's a Brandeisian point. Look to state constitutions. They're the Ellen, laboratories. Remind me, next year we'll change it to the Sussman conversation on the constitutions, plural, yes. and the courts. Constitutions, we'll it's good. That's good. good. So let me ask you this, Senator Whitehouse. Isn't it just clearly, isn't it clearly unconstitutional for the Senate to refuse to vote on Obama's appointment of Judge Garland? Isn't, isn't that just the idea that, oh, well, let's wait to see who's the next president? Isn't that totally unconstitutional? It's totally unprecedented. It is unprecedented? In my view, absolutely. I can't think of any circumstance like it. I agree. And... Um, this is one of those constitutional questions where you have to start at the back end first, at the answer, and then work your way back into it. And the ultimate question is, is this enforceable? Is this a justiciable controversy that a court will hear in the way that some constitutional claims could be heard? I don't think there's a court. Like a right to have a gun in your home for self-protection or contraception in your home. Both Courts justiciable rights. Courts will enforce I happen those. to go more with Warren Berger that the Second Amendment theory is a fraudulent yeah. notion that was later packed in by political power of the NRA and mm -hmm. other groups. As, mm -hmm. And the Heller decision results from that politics, not mm -hmm. from anything else. But mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. just uh, my view. Yeah. But there also are things in the Constitution that are set out as our guiding plan but are not necessarily enforceable by a judge. And they are left to all of us as witnesses to, if we think they're decided wrong, penalize the folks who are violating what we think should be done. And so right now, in a lot of these states, uh, particularly in the Senate races and a lot of the close races, there is a kind of de facto referendum going on on is it constitutional and is it proper for the court, for the Senate, to refuse to uh, even give a hearing, even consider, even take up a nominee. It is certainly within the power of the majority leader of the United States Senate to refuse to bring a matter to the floor, period. So, and, and, Senator Whitehouse, and, and he this, might not be, and the interesting question is not just what voters think. I, I'm with you in everything you said, but I would add one. I'm not sure, even though I want Merrick Garland confirmed and, and I, I've got some thought, you know, strategies for that, I'm not sure that Senator McConnell is violating his own oath of office um, by not bringing it to the floor. He's wow. taken a solemn oath to the Constitution. 
Um, Why not? Be, be, well, I'll pull a Steve Sussman because I don't see ah, in this time you know, he looked here. at the Constitution. Right, right. Well, no, no, but I mentioned the Ninth <laughs> Amendment and the Fourteenth. It always starts in the text. It's not there. There's not a, a right to have a hearing or a committee vote or a floor vote. Um, it doesn't distinguish the between. Shall nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate. Appoint. Right, but the, the, the Senate way. can withhold its advice and consent. And I want Garland confirmed. He'd, he'd be what great. What do you think of? Is it constitutional to limit the terms of Supreme Court justices? There actually are ways to do it. But, but Sheldon said one other thing that's important, which is even though they have a constitutional right to do this, the power and the right, this is bad. It's unprecedented. Our government doesn't work when one side does this, and then when the other folks come in, what goes around comes around. And Sheldon is a great public servant who actually wants government to work. Um, and and, and, and so, when, so the precedents actually are important okay. when... It's a but new abnormality yes. okay, when we need to you, have regular order this restored one? more often. How about this one, Senator Whitehouse? As we sit here today, there are 100 vacancies on the federal court benches in this country, 30 of which are judicial emergencies. Yep. This is caused by having the president of one party and a Senate of another party. Right. And we might be doing this, we may have a do again if the Senate and the White House go to different parties in the upcoming election. And, I mean, even if it's the, this time, it's the Democrats yep. Yep. who control the Senate and there's a Trump White House. What changes can be made in the Senate? What can you and your colleagues do to avoid this problem? It's always tit for tat, you know, they did it to me, so I'm gonna do it to them. Uh, what can be done about that so we don't face this where we have a divided branches of government, which is what the Constitution anticipated anyway? The hard stop thing that we already did was to get rid of the filibuster for lower level judicial appointees, circuit and district courts, <coughs> done. So that means now that if the American public is angry enough about the clogging up of the judicial branch of government for political purposes, there's a solution ready to hand, which is to elect the party that wants to put the judges in, and now with 51 votes, we can do it. Clear them one after another. The larger question is one of how the Senate operates and comity in the Senate. And what has happened is that um, a lot of people come out of committees just fine. The Judiciary Committee moves a lot of judges through, and they go and they sit on the executive calendar of the Senate for weeks, for months, in some cases for years, and they are effectively a hostage pool that can be used for a whole variety of purposes to negotiate other and unrelated matters. And uh, I think, frankly, what we need is a more human sense that when people come forward to do public service, to serve as an ambassador in some war-torn country, to go and get into one of these big uh, agencies of government and try to get it working right, to uh, serve as a judge in our communities, that they're entitled to a considerable measure of respect for having made that choice, and that we should be far more uh, both dignified and respectful in the way we treat them. So having somebody sit for a thousand days on the executive calendar is just, it's unseemly. Mm -hmm. And we've lost in the partisan battles the sense of seemliness. And that's actually not, so, and that sounds old fashioned, but it's actually kind of an important thing in the world I live in. I heard Senator uh, Kane, Tim K uh, Vice President nominee yeah. Kane, say the other day that uh, uh, the Congress is uh, abandoning its constitutional duty to vote, to have a resolution declaring war. I mean, America's been at war, fighting hot wars, real wars, for many, many years. And yet, we've never had a declaration of a war in, the that's Fort supposed Congress to under the Constitution being to Congress, right? So is that true? I mean, what's going on? How come you guys aren't, what is keeping you from doing, you're sworn to do the, uphold the Constitution? Is that a fair, that's not a fair question. No, I think it is a, it's a perfectly fair question. Um, and I think that it would be a good civic exercise for 
the president to present as the chief executive and the commander in chief precisely the language that he or with any luck she wants and then have us debate and discuss it and let the political process take place. I don't think that Congress itself producing spontaneously this type of a thing makes much sense. I mean, sure, immediately after Pearl Harbor, we know we're at war, everybody responds, that's the easy call. But when and where Congress suddenly decides that it's gonna move without the president serving up what it is that he or she as commander in chief wants to do gets us, I think, into a field of very considerable risk of, of mischief. So, except in really extraordinary circumstances, the ball is in the executive branch, the one that controls the military's court, to ask for what they want. They should do that. We should then be on the hook to consider and respond and be accountable for our votes for that. That's the way it should work. And in that sense, Tim Kaine is right. But as I was saying earlier about the other right, this is not an enforceable right. Nobody can go to court and say, we demand that the president cease and desist in this military conflict until Congress has passed an appropriate resolution, because the courts will never be able to figure out what's appropriate, when is that? it war. Akil. Akil, why can't I go to court and do that? Um, I mean, I'm a citizen. I'm entitled to the rights. The Constitution, that, what does it say about Congress's duty to declare war? What does it say about that? Well, we've only had four declared wars in all of American history, and that doesn't mean that we've been violating the Constitution up and down and sideways. I'm basically with Sheldon on this. The, the, the Senate and the, and the House have approved of, of um, our interventions via instruments that simply are not called declarations of war. Um, they know what they're funding. And they know that, that where that military money is going for and is going, you know, into every defense um, authorization, every defense appropriation. The, 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 a, the AUMF, the discussion. authorization, the use of military force, and then the, the second AUMF, and then these military appropriations. So they're not shocked, shocked that there's gambling going on in Casablanca or that you know American military might is being deployed in certain theaters. They they know that. Truth be told, they don't want to have their fingerprints all over it when it goes bad, um, and I get that. But what Sheldon is saying is, well, fine, but then the President of the United States should present us with um, um, a wording so that, and ask for an up-down vote. Um, and until he, and um, I don't believe that there's ever been a declaration of war that a pre I know that there's never been a declaration of war that uh, a president opposed. And I think actually, as a matter of etiquette, presidents have always asked for declarations. Well, we have them basically uh, in War of 1812, um, uh, Mexican-American War, Spanish-American War, and World War II, and that's it, basically. Um, those, I think, are the only declarations of war in all of American history. And we fought a lot of wars, and not unconstitutionally, because Congress has bought into them in the Civil War, um, in the Korean conflict, in Vietnam, um, in the war on terror, so-called. Let me uh, end uh, our, our discussion with this question to both of you. Uh, under a Clinton administration, uh, with a uh, a court that she, a Supreme Court that she appoints. Uh, we know Citizens United is in the crosshairs, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion, what else is likely to happen in, use a crystal ball to tell me what else might happen over the next five years or four years or 10 years or something, in changes in the jury, what else is it? Issue. You asked me in passing um, about whether I mean, I I'm going to ask it for right. Trump too. Uh, whether there could be term limits for the court, I actually think they can't. There could be without a constitutional amendment. The way it would work is for by statute, you're a judge for life. Um, you're on the Supreme Court even for life, but you basically uh, um, are um, uh, uh, on the back bench after the first 18 years, and you only sit, you know, if the if the court is short staffed. So you get your money, you 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 do, um, but but we could structure it. What's better about 18 years? It divides nicely. There are nine justices. That means that there are two vacancies for every president, and you know, you we 
know which two vacancies will arise, and then we can actually talk about, well, if Ginsburg steps down and Breyer or Kennedy, now which are the issues where they were the swing voters, and therefore, you know, what would happen um, if those seats became vacant? Right now, it's ugly speculation. Oh, well, her medical condition and his financial situation, ooh, that's icky for us to try to talk every four years about what the court might likely be, because it all depends on whether they choose to step down. Here's one fine. Court uh, judges in general, th their first choice is to basically live forever. This is not given to them, so their second choice is ideally to judicially clone themselves. They tend to try to step down on the watch of a president that's sympathetic to their point of view, so they get a, a younger version of themselves. Scalia didn't make it, you see, so sometimes it doesn't quite work. But what that does mean is there are not that many balance shifting vacancies, because what tends to happen is liberals try on the court to step down on the watch of a liberal president, and conservatives try to step down on the watch of a conservative president. So, so that's why there's such a big deal about the Scalia thing, because this is balance shifting. The Republican appointees have controlled the United States Supreme Court in, for the entirety of my adult lifetime, for the last 50 years since 1970, and so this is a big one, because now it's in play. I would say three quick things. One, we will see that the Heller decision was actually a pretty narrow decision as it, it gets read uh, it, and bounded by later, by later decisions. By later decisions. Second, the court's going to have to clean up the wreckage that it's created in our electoral system, and that's going to require revisiting Citizens United. And third, I think that we're going to have to make a decision, and the courts are going to have to make a decision about whether the civil and criminal juries are significant institutions in our democracy. The Founding Fathers for sure thought they were, and the Founding Generation for sure thought they were. They said no to the Constitution until they saw that there was going to be a Seventh Amendment. And from Blackstone to de Tocqueville to Madison to Hamilton, the language used about the jury as an institution of government, as a means of popular self-expression and self-governance is extraordinarily powerful. And you just read in the New York Times the other day that they've basically stopped having criminal jury trials in Manhattan. The chief judge of my US District Court in Rhode Island hasn't seen a civil jury trial in three years. And um, I think we need to rebuild that institution both because it does perform those salutary for functions of having governance take place at the local level by local people and in an institution that isn't fixable because it's always new people. They're not repeat players that you can make a deal with, take care of, give their brother-in-law a job, none of that. It's the cleanest institution in government and for that reason I think the very powerful organizations that come to government seeking things mm -hmm. are terrified and horrified. Mm -hmm. They can control the executive branch with all sorts of lobbying and political influence. They can control the legislature with all sorts of lobbying influence and electoral interference. They, and then they come to the jury. Honest. And they can't do a thing. The stuff that they, try, that they do with us day in and day out is a crime. Tampering with a jury if you try it. And to lose that spark of independence in our government when so much political power is on the loose is a terrible price to pay, and I don't think most people see, as that spark diminishes, how bad that price is going to be as it evaporates. I, I'm, thank you for that too. Let's, let's give fair time to the, uh, what happens under a Trump presidency with a Republican. Well, I think it's important. Uh, I think it's too unpredictable, I can't answer that question. Who knows? Who Absolutely who knows? Well, you've seen the list of people he's thinking about appointing. Yeah, but what makes us think that he would do that? He's been opposites on everything always. He was pro-choice, then he's not. He was, you know, he, there's, there's almost no issue where he doesn't argue with himself four years ago, himself five years ago, himself eight years ago. And I think part of what's so strange about this candidacy is that it's really hard to know what his absolute core principles are other than that he's a really huge guy who should be president. So sh 
Sheldon. So I, 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 I have no clues that I can draw any conclusions from, other than that it's going to be weird. <laughs> Our founding fathers clearly thought in creating this democratic republic that the people we would elect to positions of influence in Washington, the members of the Senate, for example, would be real statesmen and scholars and fair in whatever party. People like you, thank you, frankly. I mean, and, and I'm exactly. so thrilled that you were exactly. there. But what do you say to a young woman or man who is thinking about running for Congress, uh, thinking about getting in politics? How can it be? Do you have fun? Yes. Do you have a sense of accomplishment? And how, how does that happen? I have. How can, what, do you, what do you think you are, are accomplishing when, we have, when you are part of the most useless Congress that we've ever had. Yeah. First of all, you do get things done. The president just signed into law a bill that I spent three years working on, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, the first major piece of addiction recovery legislation Congress has ever done. And it, it passed the Senate 94 to 1. So if you do your work and if it's the right issue, you can do that. On other issues, you are up against very powerful special interests that have unprecedented political artillery, and we have to win that fight. And I would rather lose that fight than not be in it. So even in the frustrating days, I'm glad I'm in that fight. And then just as a personal matter, the richness of my life having made the choice to get into this, the frustrations are worse, the joys are greater, and the scope of my life is much broader. I go to places in Rhode Island and see people and develop friendships and relationships and loyalties and you know, battlefield uh, brotherhoods that I would never, never have if I hadn't chosen this path. It's hard, it's tiring, it's frustrating, you have to take a lot of crap, but on balance, I feel like uh, you know, Joe DiMaggio, the luckiest man alive. Now we got about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, Alan said you would get an opportunity to ask questions. Here's, I can't hit. Here's what I asked. We have a mic, someone's got a mic around, a handheld mic that's going to be passed. So stand up when you ask the question in your seat. Speak into, we have mics on both sides. Speak into the mic and ask a question. Put a question, you can say whatever you want, but put a question mark at the end of it. Beginning over here. Robert. So, uh, I'm Bob Rosenkrantz. We've heard a lot happy, about... Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we've heard a lot about uh, Citizens United and uh, corporate contributions to uh, uh, the political process. Corporations tend to divide about 55-45 in favor of uh, Republican uh, candidates. And I'd like to try to focus on two other groups that have been very uh, powerful funders in, in politics. One is... Uh, labor unions and the other is the trial bar. And uh, I wonder if you have, uh, what distinctions do you make between uh, these two sources of uh, money and politics? The first one I would make is scale. If you look just at lobbying, corporate lobbying is $30 for every $1 that everybody else does. Labor unions, trial lawyers, uh, NGOs, you name it. So it's a blowout on the lobbying side. On the election side, um, post Citizens United, you've seen people like Tom Steyer pick up what they're doing, but it's the way the trial bar works in its, in its election work and the way the unions work is basically that they go to their members and say, give us money and we'll put it together and we'll support people well, who we like. Shelley, the you, trial bar doesn't do that at all. I'm in the trial bar. All the trial bar does is says, we urge you to get active in politics and support this candidate. Yeah. But I write the check directly to the candidate. I have never, and I've never heard of a trial bar organization that solicit funds directly for them through themselves to give right. to a candidate. Right. It's unlike the unions. We're just a bunch of individuals who happen to share common beliefs, like the, members. If I you guess. had, let's say, a ten thousand dollar limit, then I think 
you're never going to get union contributions out of union members above $10,000. They don't make the kind of money where they can give $10,000 individual contributions. So it's a whole different scale when you end up with corporations that are bigger than most countries on earth, have virtually unlimited resources, and have the ability to, through the political process, gain for themselves rewards that are many ten tens of times, in some cases many hundreds of times, what their political investment is. So I think that the corporate entity is more dangerous in that sense because it doesn't have some of those self-limiting characteristics of these group uh, affiliations like a union or a, uh, an association of, of trial lawyers. They're not a single entity that has that kind of resource and can act in the same way. And certainly, as an observer of this, there's, <laughs> there's very little so, comparison. So just on campaign finance reform, if there really is a boogeyman out there, it's not called, and it's, it is a Supreme Court case that messed up, and it's actually not called Citizens United, and you haven't heard of it. It's called McCutcheon. And here's what McCutcheon is about and what Steve was talking about. This, this is campaign contributions that go into the, the war chests uh, um, the, the, uh, that are controlled by the candidates. That is really different than putting up an ad that people can agree with or not on election day. So campaign contributions need to be limited in all sorts of ways, and corporations can be limited more because they are artificial entities. And what about people like ordinary day workers, whether they're in a union or not, who aren't wealthy enough to, to pony up in that way? Here's what real campaign finance reform looks like, and McCain-Feingold looked like nothing like that, because real campaign finance reform will mean incumbents might lose, and they won't give you a real campaign finance law, but here's what it would look like. Everyone in America, even if you're a blue-collar worker, gets a little voucher from the government. It's worth 20 bucks, and you can't use it to buy sneakers or um, uh, um, uh, groceries. You can, but you can give it to the candidate of your choice, and now everyone has a $20 voucher that they can give to a candidate of their choice. And public financing of campaigns and free airtime for candidates and, and Lincoln-Douglas public debates that are clean and non-corrupt. There's a lot that you could do. The problem is comp campaign contributions and, in my view, not independent advertising. I disagree completely with yeah. that because the independent advertising always has its evil twin, which is the threat of independent advertising. And that conversation between that political actor and the candidate is inherently corrupting and, at this point, totally unlimited in its scope. If I get a $10,000 contribution from somebody into my direct campaign fund, that's great, but that's not a big deal. That's not a game changer. That's not even issue effector. That's really just part of the grind of mm -hmm. what I have to do as yeah. fundraising. Yeah. But if a big, 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 big powerful interest comes to me and says, cross us again on this, right. and I'm putting $10 million worth of independent expenditure right. up against you, right. and so you've got to behave, that is a game changer and for people, and I've seen Post it change. And the Washington Post and the New York Times and Fox and, and Murdoch and all this and Ted Turner can do that already, and no, they, they have can't. to be allowed to. They absolutely cannot. There is nothing the Washington Post can say that could have that kind of an effect. Stuart Bernstein, ever. you're next. Uh, Stuart Bernstein, excellent discussion. Uh, today at our Aaron Fleck weekly uh, luncheon, it was pretty unanimous that our system is broken. That's why Trump is coming on like he is and changes have to be made, and maybe the, it's happening. But what happened with the system of compromise? And, and what, how do you fix it? How do you change the mindset so that the Congress <laughs> whose approval rating is 10% or 12% changes? As the member of Congress here, I think that part of it is what the public has to demand. But in, in my world, what the public demands is not a very primary factor. Because day to day, the power of organized special interests is, has much, much, much more effect. 
And the perfect example of that is the NRA able to completely discipline the entire Republican Party virtually and some people in ours on public questions that are supported by 90% of the public and that frankly make perfect sense. But in a situation in which you have this new artillery on the political battlefield, the power shift of that is very strong. Uh, let me put it, it, if you go back to Machiavelli, if you go back to um, what President Jackson wrote when he vetoed the first uh, national bank, if you go back to a lot of the conversation about our uh, politics, there's a distinction that people reflect between the public who basically just want to be left alone. You know, just let me do my thing. Just don't screw around with me. And then there are the people who make it their business, the courtiers, the people who make it their business to attach themselves to government and extract things from government for their benefit. In the old days, it was nobles and laborers. Afterwards, it became special interests in the general public. But there's always been the difference between the people who are the influencers and the people who don't particularly care to be influencers, but by God, they want a government that hasn't been taken over by the damned influencers. So you're saying it's all money. It's, at the moment, it's the money and the threat of money. And the threat is cheaper than the money. Shall so it's right? actually... Could we fix it by saying that if you were a member of Congress or the Senate, you can serve, you got six years or eight years, or pick a term, but you can't rerun. So. You can't be threatened. You are immune from threats if you don't care about keeping this job. You can. So why don't we do that? Isn't it more important to have a group of people in Washington who are immune, immune from threats from big money than, than to have a group of people who are, quote, experienced? Who yeah. the hell cares about their experience? They can't do anything anyway. Yeah. It's, I mean, who cares? Yeah. The the, uh, the concern with that is that you, you end up going back to a kind of machine politics type mode, and instead of focusing on the individual candidate, you go back to the party, and then you just get a churn of, you know, you end up with the Senate before the 17th Amendment. They're good. And that may not be an improvement. There's a good argument on each side of this. I just remind you, because I do think the next conversation should be about constitutions, that some states have term limits, and others don't, we could actually examine whether the states that have term limits in general yeah, now is a kind of experiment, Brandeisian, are better or not. It has all sorts of, you know, do states that have term limits have more women because they're more open seats? There are all sorts of really interesting questions you can ask. In theory, you know, uh, um, uh, what Shel one thing that Sheldon's saying, he's so modest, but he knows a ton. And it took him a while to learn all of this. Now, maybe you say you can't do anything because it's, it's all gridlocked. But if you have only amateur lawmakers in a world that's pretty complicated, the people who have the information get control of everyone. And those tend to be corporate organized because they write the laws. Because it takes a while. There's a learning curve before the lawmaker. So you could argue it both ways. You could argue. Or but look at. Uh, staff, right, it makes the staff more powerful. Maybe, does, it, does it make the president more powerful if you don't have congressional beers? But we have experience at the state level that's very interesting on this. Stefan Adlas. Uh, we were at that luncheon today. Back to the real issue. Citizen United, <laughs> that's going to be a tall order to overturn. I think even Marshall before World War I suggested that um, uh, corporations are people. So what is, is there a practical way of choking that money by simply reducing the spending window, where you simply say campaign contributions and spending can only be four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, and then it doesn't matter because you can't push that much money through the funnel. Is there a possibility that can be restricted? I think it's done in Britain. Any chance yeah. of getting that done here? I don't think so. I, you know, Akhil can correct me on the constitutional law here, but I do think that for people, the First Amendment right to spend whatever you please, as long as it's clear that it's you who's doing it, is pretty hard to attack. That strikes me as pretty basic First Amendment right for a human being 
to use their own money, to say what they want to say about politics, as long as it's, they're not hiding who they are. The next question's right here. Yes, sir. You can do any And it's a mistake to try to, first of all, you know, they get to say stuff in between in the, the, the four-week season, and as long as they just don't, and therefore vote for White House, you know, the vote for Trump, you know, you're not going to be able to stop them from doing that, and it would be a mistake to try to do that. Our problem isn't our campaigns aren't long enough, are too long. They're not long enough. There's so much you don't know about this man who could end the planet and the republic. His name is Donald Trump, and there's tons you don't know about him. We've never, ever, ever had a president who's never had a history of public service before. The problem isn't that our campaigns are too long. You don't know enough yet. So the, more speech is good, and speech costs money. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, David Ross. We all, we all know that Congress has a big problem in passing laws and getting things done. I just recently read something that I found particularly disturbing. It seems as though in the last couple of years there have been bipartisan agreements, let's call them, uh, over issues like infrastructure, fighting the Zika virus, uh, and, and education that have been sidelined by people, I believe in the House, yep. maybe the Senate, yep. um, who tack on amendments that are completely, completely unrelated to the issue. Yep. I read of one where, I, bel I believe it had to do with the Zika virus, I could be wrong, but um, there were House Republicans that wanted to put- Zika and Planned Parenthood. Okay, amendments, yep. amendments having, to, having to do with taking, um, parts of Obamacare out, or yeah. changing parts of Obamacare. Yeah. And what that does is it completely stalls yeah. what people are trying to do. Is yeah. there any way, is there any way, shape, or form, where you guys can keep to the argument at hand and stop um, putting amendments onto um, proposals that are completely unrelated to the proposal? It's, um, it's a really hard thing to enforce. And because in order to put yourself in that position of getting the amendments on that are the poison pill amendments, you ordinarily need the support of the leadership of the party that wants to get it done. And if the amendment isn't going to work, there are other ways that they can do the same thing. So I sit on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. We put an enormous amount of work into a bipartisan immigration reform. It was voted out of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate with a strong bipartisan vote after hundreds of amendments were considered and maybe 50 or 60 were accepted. It went on the floor where it had further amendments, was voted out of the Senate, and instead of sending it back to us with poison pill amendments all over it, the House, the Speaker just said, not bringing it up, no hearings, no nothing. You can't make us do it. So it's hard to do that, and there are times when constructively I try to get stuff on a bill that I know is going, and as long as it doesn't bust it up, what the hell? You know, if you know the train is going to leave the station and it's a pretty big bill, then there's a mad rush of everybody to try to get their thing onto it. And if it doesn't interfere with the progress of the train, then that's not a bad process. That's how things get done where the Senate's not going to have the time to spend three days and going through all the procedures for one relatively small amendment. And if it's not going to happen by unanimous consent, then the only other way you do it is by getting it onto a train that's going. And so how you distinguish between the constructive use of that and the malicious use of that is really, really hard to do, particularly when the backstop always is, well, I'm just not going to bring it up. I'm Mitch McConnell, and I'm not bringing up Merrick Garland. I'm the speaker, and I'm just not bringing up the Senate uh, Im immigration bill. Question right here. So it's hard. My name is Bert Sharp. <clears throat> the uh, founders talked about an informed electorate in a variety of ways. And obviously one of their concerns was the ability to, to sustain a constitutional state depended upon having an informed electorate. Right. Would you comment on the qualities of an informed electorate, the role of public education, as discussed by John Dewey in his book, Democracy and Education, in the current political scene and in our ability to sustain a democracy? We have two hazards that I'd mention. One is that civics took a beating in our public education system. 
First, as we stripped money out of our public education system, and as then, as, then as we tried to fix it by saying, okay, we're gonna test all these schools on these things, and if you flunk, your kids flunk this, then we're coming after your school. And when they did that, like a vessel that was afraid it was gonna sink, they threw all of the curriculum over the side that wasn't on the test. And so you had this just stripping out of curriculum in particularly urban and rural poor schools. And the result was, there's a very, very weak sense of how the Constitution works and all the compromise, all, all that. And I think strengthening that ought to be a, a national purpose. The second thing is we have enormous amounts of myths and disinformation that are being propagated as if they were real. And whether that's through the um, blogosphere or through Fox News or through phony baloney groups that put up phony baloney studies that are funded by an industry and actually are you know, just false. I grew up when the Cuyahoga River burned and we had a societal shift that we were gonna improve our environment. And I grew up with like canned lima beans and Wonder Bread and a, a health food store was a weird place to go where you had to measure your own almonds. And now you've got like, you know, huge massive chains that do incredible business in, in uh, health food. And we made a societal shift to be more responsible about our uh, environment. We made a societal shift to be more responsible about our diet. And we need now to make a societal shift to be more responsible about our political information because much of our political information is pollution and junk food right now. And we need to make that shift. And when we do, I think we'll be a stronger country. Jeff Peterson, yes. I have a question uh, related to the Second Amendment. My name is Frank Orlando. I'm from the state of Florida. It has more guns than any other state in the United States. And uh, it's a fearful place to live at sometimes. Uh, the senator made a comment about Chief Justice Berger. Recently, Justice John Paul Stevens wrote a book called Six Amendments, where he tells us, in a way, that the Constitution is a growing document, and he tells us six ways to, to amend the, do, the six amendments that are giving us the most problem. And in the chapter, he talks about Justice Berger, and he saying that in his time and before his time, there never was a justice on the Supreme Court that didn't believe that the Congress or the states didn't have the right to regulate the sales of guns. And He's on the McNear Lair radio program five years later, and he's quoted as saying, the Second Amendment uh, issues that are being forced on us today by the special interests in this country, and I believe he's talking about the National Rifle Association, a corporation, uh, are the greatest fraud, and I repeat the word fraud, ever forced it on the people of America. My question is, did the Heller decision take Justice Berger's thoughts about the fraud committed by the NRA and make it the law of the United States and put in the Second Amendment, self-defense, and professor, I'm a law professor too, and I was a judge for 20 years, and I completely disagree with you about your comments with the 14th Amendment. People are buying guns today because the, the Supreme Court has said every person has a right to have a gun for self-defense, and when the, the, the Supreme Court was regularly saying, if it didn't have something to do with a self-regulated militia, it could be outlawed. And the last one I know about for that was a sawed-off shotgun. Thank you. Yeah, it was. You've echoed the point I made, and you have recited Justice Berger's quote extremely accurately. And so, when he said, "And I repeat, fraud," he was not repeating fraud. That was Justice Berger saying, "And I repeat, fraud." So, so can I? Go ahead. Okay, so I'm actually going to hold forth now. <laughs> you got two minutes. <laughs> so you get the last word. I like John Paul Stevens. I had great respect for Warren Burger, neither is a constitutional scholar. You asked about civic education, here's the problem. The document, you can read it in 20 minutes, but you actually 
need to study it a lot to know, well, what does that second sentence of the, of, of the 14th Amendment really mean? And what does the Ninth Amendment and how is the Second Amendment reinterpreted in light of the 14th? And Americans need to know that because we are at risk of losing our public. This is what civic education is all about. It's not on the test anymore. And so I spend my summers with high school teachers and students who are doing God's work in civics education. So now, I'm, so I need to be straight with you, and I'm actually going to, this is an ad. I have been a constitutional scholar for 30 years. That's all I do every day as I get up and I study the Constitution and try, and John Paul Stevens doesn't do that. He was a judge, and he has to decide antitrust cases and, and um, employment discrimination cases um, and um, uh, cases involving everything under the sun. Very few of them actually involve first principles of constitutional law. And that's true of Warren Burger. They're not bad people, but they are not constitutional scholars. Not remotely so. None of them went to Yale Law School and graduated first in this class. OK? They just didn't. So now you need to know in a world, because you know, whom do you pay attention to? You know, who has credibility? Who's done the work? I don't like guns. They scare the hell out of me. I began thinking that Warren Burger was right. It turns out he's not, and John Paul Stevens isn't. Now, how do you know? Because I've written six books, and they're free to the world. There are these things called libraries. You can read them. <laughs> and there are two things that are also free to the world. They're called MOOCs, not just B-O-O-K, M-O-O-C. A MOOC is a massive, open, online course. Yale has, has produced these. They're free to the world. Um, in partnership with an organization called Coursera, whose president is Rick Levin, who used to be the president of Yale. So I have these MOOCs, and I want you to, you can do it right now when you go home. You can actually sign up for these. They're free courses on the Constitution based on books that I've written on the Constitution that are designed for 12th graders and for college undergraduates and for law students and for my fellow citizens. Because I like Warren Berger a lot. He was a decent man. John Paul Stevens is a decent man. They don't know what they're talking about because they are not constitutional scholars. And I might be wrong, but I'm not partisan. No one's giving me money. I've said some left things. I've said some right things here. But, but, you, but, but with all due respect, what you said isn't true. It's what I was taught when I was a student, and I've spent years studying it and trying to figure out what, where the evidence actually lies. You can decide for yourself, but there's lots of evidence in these MOOCs and books. And for the record, since I'm sitting here on this stage while he says this, I'm with Warren Burger, notwithstanding. And I love Akhil Amari, somebody I read for pleasure. He, he's I think always he's perfectly nice. bright, but I think Warren Burger has the better of this argument. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse and Professor Amar for being here. We need, as informed citizens of this country, to spend more hours like this learning about our Constitution. Before, and hopefully this can be replicated over and over again across the country. Thank you for coming. That was great.